Welcome everyone um, to this week's CTQM seminar. Uh, so this week uh, we're fortunate to have our colleague Marcus Flum from the from over in the math department, uh, and I think he's actually sitting in his office in the math building, uh, unlike where many of us are located at the moment. Uh, so uh, Marcus got his PhD in Munich in uh, 1995. Um, he was a professor in Frankfurt for a little while, and then he moved to uh, the faculty here in Boulder uh, with tenure in 2007, which is actually the same time I started. So Marcus and I probably sat in the same new faculty orientation, and maybe I remember him from that time, but I'm not sure. Uh, I've only gotten to know him more recently over the past um, two or three years uh, when we've been starting to collaborate on uh, some problems. Um, and so, uh, and I guess the work of Marcus's that I'm most familiar with uh, is within mathematical physics. There are other, other bits of work that I don't know so well, uh, but what he's going to talk about today, uh, and now I don't have his title in front of me, um, is, uh, is definitely you know, part of mathematical physics. It's on the topic of deformation quantization. Um, all right, so uh, thanks Marcus. Looking forward to hearing your talk. Yeah. Thanks, Mike, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you, um, Victor and Oliver, and uh, obviously Mike, too, for the invitation to speak in the CTQM seminar. As uh, Mike already has pointed out, I will talk about the topic in deformation quantization, so let me just share the screen so that you can see um, the, the exact title, which is Deformation Quantization and an Application to Lattice Gauge Models. So the plan for the talk is to concentrate more or less mostly on deformation quantization and at the end um, talk a little bit about uh, lattice gauge models. Um, deformation quantization has been a, a research area uh, of mine actually since, yeah, since I started uh, doing uh, scientific work. Uh, so my first one was uh, when I was a, a student of Julius Wess in Munich and I worked on quantum groups there. And then afterwards I got my PhD in the math department and I wrote a thesis on uh, deformation quantization and pseudo differential operators. So this has been a long time project of mine and I would like to give a little introduction and then at the end, tell a little bit about the most recent work um, jointly with Gerd Rudolf in Leipzig and uh, Matthias Schmidt also in Leipzig on uh, this lattice gauge models where we constructed a deformation quantization of um, some lattice gauge models. Okay, let me start. And the, um, I will plan to start with some motivational remarks and actually it will be a little bit longer because I would like to explain the problem of quantization. So before I come to deformation quantization and quantization in principle is the um, idea how to inverted commas derive or have a good guess of a quantum uh, mechanical dis uh, or a mathematical description of a quantum mechanical system out of the classical mechanical system. So now to describe that mathematically, one needs to know how these systems are described mathematically. So let me start with classical mathematical systems. And um, for both of these, the classical and the quantum mechanical systems, one needs to know what the space of states is, the observables, measurements, time developments. So let me start here with what is classically the space of states or uh, the phase space from the point of view of mathematics. So this is, I mean, as you teach much more than I, um, usually R to N, but uh, you can generalize this to a cotangent bundle if you want to use a language of uh, manifolds or even a symplectic manifold. So these form the mathematical corresponding gadgets of what a phase space is. A phase space in this sense is equipped or endowed with a symplectic form omega, which by definition is a closed non-degenerate two form. Yeah? So non-degenerate means it gives an isomorphism between uh, fiberwise between the tangent and the cotangent um, spaces. <clears throat> and um, it, closed means that d omega is zero. 
So if M is the standard phase space R to N, one can write it down very easily in, in coordinates. It's omega is dx i wedge dx i plus n, where you sum from i is one to n. So the first x i you can regard as uh, the position operators and the uh, second half of the x i plus n's as the momentum operators. And by the famous Dabu theorem, locally any symplectic manifold um, is locally of that form r to n with the symplectic form given in these uh, canonical coordinates. Okay, so that's the space of states. The next thing is what are the observables in these language? So the measurable quantities and these form an algebra, namely the algebra of smooth functions on M. The symplectic form on the underlying symplectic manifold induces then a, a bracket, the so-called Poisson bracket on that manifold and locally, um, actually, not only in R to N, but locally in any um, symplectic manifold where you have chosen coordinate, uh, canonical coordinates, the Poisson bracket is given in this standard form. You all know, rather, I guess you all teach in, in your classical mechanics classes uh, by uh, the DF, DXI, DG, DXI plus N, and then um, you alternate the XIN xi plus n's with the xi's. Okay, that uh, Poisson bracket obviously fulfills the Jacobi identity. It's a, it's a Lie bracket on the algebra of smooth functions on M. Now, physically, what does it uh, mean that you have a measurement in, in classical mechanics? That would be just the evaluation of an observable. So you have an observable f, you have prepared your classical system in a state x, and f of x is then the measurement you would get in the classical system. And this is a deterministic approach. Um, and it's, uh, well, it has turned out to be an extremely uh, well functional um, theoretical description of classical mechanical systems. I also write down time development, even though I will not uh, use this in the remainder of the talk, but that's just given by the Hamilton equations. So if you have an observable and your X here is just a path of points in the, in the state space M, how does the measurement or the um, change then over time? So DF composed with X by DT is then just the, the Poisson bracket of F with the Hamiltonian at X of T. So that should be um, at the right-hand side, the X of T um, is missing. Okay, now let's come to the quantum mechanical side. Well, I start here with the space of observables and that will be usually the set of self adjoint or Hermitian operators acting on a Hilbert space H. It can be unbounded, but um, that is more at this point here, um, a technical detail. It's highly non-trivial from math, from the mathematical and physical side, but um, I just, just uh, don't go into those details of unbounded operators. Um, more generally, one can regard observables as self-adjoint elements in a C-star algebra A. So this C-star algebraic approach uh, to quantum mechanics has been extremely powerful. It has been used uh, also in quantum field theory and has far reading co uh, reaching consequences and it's probably the most aesthetic and most powerful approach. Um, but what we need here is just that the space of observables corresponds to a certain algebra, respectively the self-adjoint elements of such a star algebra actually. Now, what are the states in this picture? Well, these form, if you look at uh, operators on Hilbert space, uh, these states are given by race in the Hilbert space, which are, represented by unit vectors or one-dimensional subspaces. More generally, uh, the positive normalized linear functionals on the c star algebra A are uh, the self-adjoint elements. If you represent the c star algebra on a Hilbert space, um, then you get back this ray representation, so to speak. Now, what's measurement? That's uh, here, um, the expectation value of a quantum mechanical measurements is given um, by the um, um, pairing out. Oh, so that's uh, somehow 
uh, didn't go through. What is it? So you have uh, the observable A, you have the ray C psi, and then the measurement is just apply A to psi and um, pair it uh, again with psi. So what is missing here is the inner product of psi with A psi. So th this is uh, what you all know and know very well. Um, and it should be here on the right hand side. So the time development is obviously given by the Schrodinger equation where um, H roof is the, um, it's the, the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian. Okay, now what is quantization according going back to Dirac? So the passage from the classical to the quantum mechanical description of a physical system is called quantization. And uh, in a certain sense, uh, where this showed up, to my knowledge, the first time is understanding the hydrogen atom. Well, classically, that is the Kepler problem. And quantum mechanically, well, that's the hydrogen atom. And um, uh, the, the passage from one to the other, uh, that would be a quantization in the sense of Dirac. OK, what uh, did Dirac propose in more detail? Actually, he did this in his thesis. And then uh, it was published in the paper, The Fundamental Equations of Quantum Mechanics. And there he suggested that one has an algebra of quantized observable was acting on some uh, other space, I mean, a Hilbert space usually. And um, he wrote down uh, the following. The fundamental assumption is that the difference between the Heisenberg products of two quantum quantities is equal to IH over two pi, the Poisson bracket expression. And I wrote down also the page. So uh, in this paper from, um, actually the paper appeared earlier than this thesis, um, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and the reference is given below. Okay, if you write that down mathematically, it means the following. The, the difference between the Heisenberg products, that's just the commutator of the quantized entities and the Poisson bracket, that's exactly what I had uh, shown before. And the IH bar, uh, that's just the factor um, in front of the Poisson bracket. So the commutator of quantized observables coincides with IH bar of the quantization of the Poisson bracket of the originally classical observable. That is nowadays called canonical or Dirac quantization. Yeah, it's, it depends a bit on the community, but th that's behind of all this. Um, canonical quantization, I read the name comes from the fact that in principle, the idea was to have a quantization procedure independent of the canonical observables um, you have chosen to describe your symplectic manifold or your classical physical system. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, yeah, here, just uh, the, the, the language. Unfortunately, there's a, um, a really difficult problem with this. So, and that are, is the Grunewald van Hoeven no-go theorem. Um, van Hoeven, I think, was the director of CERN for a while. Um, these are, um, Grunewald van Hoeven were Dutch-Belgium uh, physicists. And they found uh, a certain no-go theorem, which I would like to explain now. So. You have a symplectic manifold given. You look at the smooth functions and you look at the Poisson bracket. By definition, this forms a Lie algebra, okay? And uh, what Grunewald van Hoeven in a certain sense did is they translated the Dirac's quantization condition in a representation theoretic problem in terms of Lie algebras. Okay, now, what does a quantization then mean? In principle, it means that you represent this Lie algebra of um, smooth functions on the um, symplectic manifold by operators, linear operators on some complex vector space H. Yeah, It actually is not necessary here that this H is a Hilbert space. Obviously, one wants that in the end, but just for the mathematical uh, problems arising, just you represent that Lie algebra on a, a complex vector space H, okay? And now um, there is this theorem by Grunewald and von Hofer that says the following. So look at the Lie algebra of polynomials on R2n. 
So not uh, the full smooth functions, but just the polynomials in the um, momentum and position operators, okay? And uh, this obviously forms a Lie algebra, again, by the Poisson bracket. And you look at a sub Lie algebra given just by uh, the span of the fundamental functions one, the constants function one, and then just the momentum and the position operator, uh, not operators, uh, classical functions of position and uh, momentum. So this gives two n plus one functions and it's a two n plus one dimensional sub Lie algebra of this G. By Heisenberg actually, there is a representation of this Lie algebra by the classical or standard, uh, no, actually it's, it's Schrödinger or Heisenberg, uh, whatever, either one will work. Heisenberg did the, the Heisenberg matrices, the infinite dimensional and Schrödinger, the Schrödinger representation. But the claim is that this faithful and irreducible representation cannot be extended to a full representation of the Lie algebra G. Whatever you want to do, it will not work. And actually you cannot, I think um, you can even restrict um, the degree of the polynomials. Um, so you cannot even go beyond degree three or something. I don't remember exactly what the upper bound was, um, but that's why this is called actually the Grunewald von Hofen no go theorems. So they even did some work on the um, finding an upper bound where you cannot extend that. Anyway, so in a certain sense, um, the question arises, does um, Dirac's quantization um, condition uh, make sense still? Yeah. So is it impossible? Does it make sense? Yes or no? And the answer is actually not quite. Dirac's original ansatz or idea needs some alteration. And that is where the mathematical quantization theorem uh, theories come in. There are actually two ways out. And one is geometric quantization by Costan. So you Marcus, could I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure, please. Uh, yeah, this is Oliver. So I was just wondering if I consider some elementary physical system like a harmonic oscillator or yes. the Coulomb potential or something like that. What is the consequences of the gronwald van Hove theorem? Like, do I, do I see it in such an elementary case? Um, the point is you would actually see it if you would uh, look at observables of higher order um, where the order of uh, the momenta and the position is three or something. Yeah. So you would have to write down and then you would have find some consistency, but you will later see, um, and I will come back to your question when going to deformation quantization, one can actually um, inverted comma heals this. So this is not, um, and my impression is that physicists somehow silently do this. Um, this full Lie algebra representation for the harmonic oscillator will not hold on the nose as originally written down by Dirac, even in the harmonic oscillator case. So what you need then is to do to have higher correction terms as soon as your degree of the polynomials and momenta is higher. Um, but most, if I remember correctly, most observables which are interesting from the point of view of physics are at most degree two and there you don't see it really. So um, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Marcus, is, um, is this uh, the same as the factor ordering problem or is it related? Um, it's related but it's not the same one. Okay. They are related and I will make, I have not, I don't have a slide on this but I can also um, come back actually uh, as soon as I have introduced deformation quantization to that problem, uh, both questions again. Oliver, does that uh, at least halfway answer your question or? I, I guess partway, and I guess you're gonna talk about it later. I, I was just sort of wondering like, you know, under what circumstances would I ever notice this if I was yeah. trying to do physics? You would notice it as soon as you come into higher order observables. Yeah, I mean, and then, and then what would I see? Let's say, let's say I'm really interested in, in, you know, the observable position to the fourth power or something like that. Yes. Is, is, it, it seems, because this, this is a classical statement, right? It's just a statement about 
plus own brackets. Yes. Um, what, what, what would go wrong or what would I see that was funny if I wanted to calculate like yes. position to the fourth in the harmonic oscillator? If you take um, a quantization, let's say one which you teach in your, in your uh, quantum mechanics class, and you would uh, and you write this down in fully, and then you would see that this uh, Dirac quantization condition would not hold um, for those four dimension or uh, order four observables, but that you would have correction terms. That's one way out. That right. I see. So the so the co like commutator of x to the fourth with some other high order operator yes, would not is. be equal to the you just take where if you just take the Poisson bracket of the corresponding yeah. classical observables and promote yeah. that to an exactly. operator. I see. I see. Because and and that that comes to um, Shanta's question. Um, what one usually what one can do is take via quantization, which goes back to the uh, mathematician and mathematical physicist Hermann Weil, and he wrote something uh, a quantization down in terms of operator theory. And if you would use that, you would first get a nice ordering prescription, mm -hmm. and you would see in the fourth order or fourth degree observables that this direct quantization condition is not an equality, but you have a correction term. I see. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, Marcus. Well, that helps. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the geometric quantization by Costa and Soryo and Kirillov, they were actually, uh, Costa and Soryo worked together to my knowledge and Kirillov they had a, a kind of independent development in the former Soviet Union. So what they, they do is, um, ah, let me just go up here. So they worked um, in use uh, by using complex analysis and what is the, um, the weakening of Dirac's uh, condition is the irreducibility is relaxed and it's not required that all uh, classical observables can be quantized. Actually, what they do is they, they um, create or they only have first order differential operators acting on a Hilbert space of uh, holomorphic functions. Um, I don't want to go much into details. There has been a lot of development, I would say, in the 70s and 80s on this. Um, nowadays, it's, it's not so uh, popular in inverted commas anymore, uh, but it's still a very powerful and mathematically interesting theory. The other one goes back to Bayard, Flato, Fronstal, Lichrenaowitz, and Sternheimer, and they introduced deformation quantization. So what's the idea there is H bar is regarded as a formal parameter, and Dirac's quantization condition is, regard, is, is relaxed in the sense that it's regarded only asymptotically, yeah? So that this is what has Dirac has written down is just the first order equality, but it can be corrected in higher orders. So let me just um, give the, the, the full definition of uh, deformation quantization in the sense of, um, like Alan Weinstein says, spuffles, yeah? This stands for Bayan, Flato, and so on. So they, define a deformation quantization or star product on N, an associated product star on formal power series in lambda. So lambda is kind of your formal H bar. And the coefficients in front are smooth functions on M. And uh, the first thing is that for each K, there are these by differential operators, um, CK, such that this a star B is just an expansion sum of K um, in N, C, K, A, B, lambda to the power K. And um, the important thing is C0 is just the prod standard commutative product of functions. So in other words, this means this is a deformation of the standard commutative product, yeah? So this is where you get your algebra out, the algebra, your non-commutative algebra, you perturb or you deform your standard commutative product um, in higher orders. And the second condition is just more or less an easy one. The old one is the new one. One star A is A star one is A. And then, but that's the crucial one is um, the Dirac's quantization condition holds up to higher order. Meaning the commutator with respect to this product star is I lambda the Poisson bracket plus O lambda squared. So there are higher orders in lambda. 
And from the point of view of physics, I mean, lambda should be h bar. So h bar squared is extremely small. And um, well, it's, it's, it's so small that it's, I don't know, I'm not an experimentalist, but that it's probably not even measurable or hardly measurable or hardly visible. But just this slight change in approach makes the whole thing work. Okay, and Buffels gave um, an example, actually the so-called Weil-Moyal product, which was constructed much earlier in some sense by Weil, but Moyal wrote it down explicitly. And let me just give this. So they proved such a deformation quantization exists already uh, in R2N. And what you do here is you have this pi, pi, pi vector pi, which is delta xi delta xi plus one, and then you, you change it around. The only difference to the Poisson bracket is that, um, I mean, if you want to get the Poisson bracket, you insert f and g, and then you concatenate uh, the tensor product to a, a product of functions. But anyway, the, the bi vector pi, what you can do here is you can just take its exponential, um, where you put in front of the pi minus i lambda over two, and then you apply this to f tons of g, you get a power series out, and then you multiply all those um, tensor products of functions, and you get one, one power series and lambda of functions out. And it's actually not a difficult uh, thing to show that that is a star product in the sense defined before. Yeah. OK. And um, actually, one can work with this. So um, the harmonic oscillator, you can use the you can use this Weil-Moyal product, yeah? And you will see if you use this um, for the harmonic oscillator or um, that it, yeah, that you have these correction terms as soon as you have an observable of degree three or higher, yeah? Okay, but now from the point of view of mathematical mathematics, the question arises, does every symplectic manifold have a deformation quantization or star product. And this turned out to be a highly non-trivial mathematical problem. It was solved actually by de Waal-Leconte in 1983. They showed using methods from Hochschild homology that um, every symplectic manifold carries a star product. The proof is quite technical and homological in nature, which is definitely non-constructive. That makes it a bit difficult to understand, uh, even though it's a powerful proof. So people looked for other ways, and it turned out that there is a simple geometric construction of star products going back to Fizdasov. Actually, the title of his paper is The Simple Geometric Construction of a Star Product on a Symplectic Manifold. Even though I personally don't think it's that simple, it's natural and uh, um, it's beautiful, but you need, um, I mean, you need some connection theory and uh, it's, it's still somewhat involving, but it is constructive. So that's uh, definitely a progress towards the Dewey de Conde approach. Nevertheless, after this, people ask, okay, can you do the same thing with Poisson manifolds? And this turned out to be an extremely hard problem, and it was solved in 1997 by Maxim Konsevich. So he used rational homotopy theories from algebraic topology, where at first you would think, well, how, how is that connected to quantization theory? But he had this uh, really amazing idea to use rational homotopy theory and graph theory to prove that every Poisson manifold carries a star product. And that, I mean, he proved lots of other things as well, but um, to my understanding, this work was the major point why he received the Fields Medal, I think in two, I think it was in uh, 1990, uh, either in 2000 or 1998. So Marcus, can you remind me what a Poisson manifold is? I should probably know. Ah, okay, sure. Thank you that, that you mentioned this. In principle, it's a relaxation of symplectic manifold. It only means it's a smooth manifold and it's a bracket on C infinity of M which uh, comes from a bi-vector field and um, is, it, it, I mean, it's fulfills Jacobi identity is, a, um, I mean, it's a Lie algebra, yeah? So this is, it's just, uh, 
in principle, a symplectic manifold without a symplectic form. So you have your Poisson bracket with the same properties, Jacobi identity, anti-symmetric, and so on, and the derivation in each component. Yeah, and there are some uh, manifolds which are Poisson but not symplectic. Um, in particular, when you go to Lie groups and Lie algebras, they possess invariant Poisson structures, but they are not symplectic forms. And yeah. can these be considered physical system phase spaces, these Poisson manifolds that are not symplectic? Um, that's actually a good question. Um, this whole Poisson Lie group and, and uh, quantum group business, there you need the Poisson, uh, the Poisson manifold approach. And uh, what's interesting is you can have odd dimensional Poisson manifolds, whereas a symplectic form uh, manifold is always even dimensional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, according to Reshetikin and Fadeev, um, these are of physical relevance. But at this point, I, I, I have to look it up exactly um, what physical interpretation those have. Yeah. But in principle, it's possible. OK, thank you. Yeah. So and uh, OK, I also I mean, actually, I uh, it's, it's maybe a bit stupid to put my name uh, behind all those, but I contributed a little bit to the field. Um, I showed that every symplectic orbifold, so these are quotients of symplectic manifolds locally by finite group actions, possess a deformation quantization. And what I did is I essentially made Fedosov's construction equivariant on finite group actions and then glued these together and showed that, that there are no obstructions appearing. But the major ingredients were just Fedosov's work and um, standard results from finite group action theory on, on smooth manifolds. But anyway, it's just for completeness reason, um, I uh, added that, um, that I contributed to this um, field. OK, but um, now, even though the quantized, deformation quantization of smooth phase spaces is well known, meanwhile, uh, interesting phase spaces in physics are either singular or infinite dimensional. So that means you don't have a smooth manifold, no symplectic manifold, or no Poisson manifold. There might be singular points, yeah? And uh, this is not by far not well known. And the phase spaces of gauge theory, they are singular or infinite dimensional, yeah? Or both at the same time. And uh, the deformation quantization of infinite dimensional phase spaces, um, in particular, Klaus Friedenhagen in Hamburg and collaborators have made some really nice progress in this. And uh, in the singular case, um, I made some progress with uh, Bordemann and Habich, and uh, most recently with uh, Rudolf and Schmidt. And this is now the second part uh, where I would like to explain a little bit how they arise and how, what you can do to quantize those, even though they will become more technical and I might um, um, be a little bit quicker, but anyway. So how do single Marcus, phase- can I ask one other thing? Yeah, sure. Sorry to interrupt. So you, you talked about existence of the deformation quantization. What, yes. what about uniqueness? What can you say about uniqueness? That's a perfect question. And the uniqueness, it is classified by a formal Dirac homology in degree two. So there are classification results. Yeah. So you can have two deformation quantizations and uh, they can be equivalent, meaning you find automor uh, no, uh, an invertible endo uh, invertible um, algebra isomorphism, or they can be non-equivalent, and one can classify those. So this is a homological result, and it depends essentially on the second, on the formal second Dirac homology class of the underlying smooth manifold. Yeah. So this can be written down. It's just very technical, and there, interestingly, um, the De Waals-Le approach is extremely important and uh, conceive its results. So there is uh, quite an amount of literature on this, but it's solved, yeah? It's just, it's not unique, yeah? But one can classify the isomorphism classes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, now mass to Meissen reduction, that is actually the mathematical counterpart of what physicists doing 
when they introduced uh, introduce angular momentum. Yeah, so you have um, symplectic manifold M, and you have a Lie group acting um, on M in a symplectic way, which means they the, the Lie group leaves the symplectic form omega invariant, and then you have a so-called moment map. This is a map from M to the dual of the Lie algebra. And it fulfills this strange condition here, D, J, Xi is Xi M inserted omega. So uh, Xi is an element of the Lie algebra and you can evaluate J at Xi. And then you can take the, uh, the exterior differential. So you get a one form, but you also get an exterior differential by taking this Xi and taking the fu fundamental vector field on M and insert that in the symplectic form. And if these two coincide, then you call that, that map uh, J um, a moment map. And the interesting observation is that this space, which is called the symplectically reduced space by Marston and Weinstein, M mod mod G, it is the zero level set of the moment map quotient out by the G action. So these are the orbits in this zero level set. That is a singular symplectic space. So it is actually partitioned in smooth symplectic manifolds, but it is not a smooth manifold in general. It's only under certain conditions to J, but it amounts to um, exactly what, what physicists understand under reduction of degrees of freedom, yeah? The Russian school have uh, done a lot of uh, um, reduction stuff mathematically, Arnold, and, and uh, but obviously also from the physics community, but from mathematics and, and the whole Marston-Weinstein school. Now, the algebra of observables here is C infinity of M mod mod G is you take the smooth functions on this zero level set. Already this zero level set need not be smooth, yeah, because J might not be a submersion. And then it's, it might have singularities. It's always a cone, one can prove that. And you take the restriction of smooth functions on the zero level set in the invariant ones. And that is your new um, observable algebra. And it carries a Poisson structure, which I did not explicitly write down yet, but anyway. Okay, now um, let me just, uh, looking at time and so on, just tell you it was for a long time, the question does do, which of those Hamil reduced Hamiltonian systems have a deformation quantization. And when I was still in Frankfurt, uh, my first PhD student and I, we, we succeeded to prove jointly with Bardemann uh, that under certain conditions on the Hamiltonian system, there exists a deformation quantization of such singular symplectically reduced spaces. Yeah? And the methods are different to any of the others before. So they are different to Duval, Leconte, Fedosov, and, um, and uh, I mean, different is maybe the wrong word. It's a combination and, uh, and addition to those methods. And what's kind of interesting is that a lot of real algebraic geometry comes in and a lot of homotopy and, and, and homological algebra. So in the following, I try to lead you a little bit through this, even though it becomes more technical, and, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll see how far I get. Okay, Marcus, can I ask a question sure. here? Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to get some intuition about what this J might mean physically. So I guess, you know, M is going to, you know, so I think I understand what G and M are, are doing here. And so J is somehow, somehow it's specifying a submanifold of M that we want to focus on, yes. I mm -hmm. guess. Um, but uh, so it, should I think of it as just, it's a, it's some, it's some way that sort of fits nicely with the symplectic structure and the G action yes. of, of specifying a submanifold of M that yes. has certain nice properties. And then we quotient out, we quotient that by the G action. Yes. Um, and then that's the phase space of interest. Yeah. So that, but I mean, I don't know, is there any, do you, is, is um, like, can you say anything else about how this arises physically? Well, um, I, I think one it's example, not that familiar to me. Sure. Um, I think one example would be you take M is R6. Yeah, I mean, just you have a, a particle moving in R3, the cotangent space is R6. 
and then you have the uh, SO3 acting on the on that, so it's rotation invariance. And then you just take, uh, I mean, the angular momentum, the classical physical angular momentum, momenta, the three, I mean, it, the dimension is three, and uh, you can write uh, the J1, J2, and J3, and they form a momentum map exactly in that sense. And actually, Marston and Weinstein, I think they, they, they came through that standard physics example uh, to this more uh, general and abstract definition. But that's exactly um, the standard example from physics, which works fully. And the idea is you just take then look at, um, I mean, a system of angular momentum zero. And uh, that, so this J inverse of zero would not be a manifold, but it's some, well, actually it could be that in angular momentum it is, but I, I don't know by heart. But anyway, and then you take out the quotient by SO3 and then you get a reduced space and that has, well, it has three dimension less, yeah? Uh, no, actually it has even more. It's uh, because you, you take out the group action and the thing. So it's, I don't know exactly the dimension one has to compute it, but that's the idea, yeah? Mm -hmm. If, if I think of G as, as so one, one example for the singular cases is when we have a gauge theory. If I think of, can I, can I think of G as my gauge group? And if so, how is J related? Is, is J a gauge orbit or something like that? Um, I, I think it is in the, in the um, lattice gauge models, which I, I mean, uh, Rudolf has worked a lot on this. Um, I think that's exactly the case. Yes, um, the whole thing here is the Lie group is finite dimensional, and uh, I mean in, in in modern gauge theory, the gauge group is infinite dimensional, if I understand correctly. So one has to do some modifications, but in principle, that's the idea. Yes, and I think there are are is recent work where all of, the, not all, but some stuff of this has been uh, transferred to the infinite dimensional case. Okay, let me just, um, does that roughly answer the question or? Okay, so um, now I wanna write down the Kusil resolution. So what one needs to do is do a lot of uh, homology theory. So one takes the smooth functions, tensors it with, uh, on M tensors it with the alternating product of G and uh, then has a map uh, defined partial where a form K form Ada is just paired with the momentum map. Then what turns out, this is a standard thing in, in, in algebraic geometry, you get a complex, it's called the coaxial complex with respect to J. Now, what um, Bodeman, Habich and I in our first paper on this problem consider, we introduced two hypotheses, namely the so-called Chenering hypothesis that if the functions J xi, the components of the momentum map generate the vanishing ideal, meaning of all smooth functions vanishing on the constraint set, then we say the generating hypothesis is fulfilled. And we have the acyclicity condition, meaning that the cosial complex is acyclic, meaning it has only homology in degree zero. And if the generating hypothesis is fulfilled, that means that the zero homology of this cosial complex is just the smooth functions on this constraint set of the pre-image of zero or under the moment map, okay? So that would be a homological description of these functions C infinity J inverse of zero. What you wanna do next is you wanna write down the smooth functions um, on, on the reduced space also in a homological way. And there you use the so-called chevalier eilenberg complex of a Lie algebra. It's essentially the Lie algebra co-chain complex, yeah? It's written down here. Um, you take again. You take higher um, wedge products of the uh, the dual of the Lie algebra, and you have here a chevalier eilenberg co-boundary written down here. Um, this appears, I mean, in many places in, in in physics, to my knowledge. For example, also in the Bachmann's theorem of symmetries in quantum mechanics, the second uh, Lie algebra cohomology appears, and so on. Um, I mean, one has to digest this, but I just wrote it down uh, that it's here. And now 
the interesting observation is that C infinity on M for a GM Miltonian system is a G module. So one obtains a, a, a Chevalier Allenberg complex. Okay, this is C dot G with values in C infinity of M. And now you can take the graded tensor product of the Kusil and the Chevalier Allenberg complex and call this the, um, well, here it's, the symbol is A dot, uh, but you can equip it with uh, a differential D, namely the sum of the, so to speak, of the uh, Kusil and the Chevalier Allenberg twice the um, Chevalier Allenberg, no, twice the, the Kosul uh, differential. And that is called the classical BRST differential. And the really interesting observation is the following, which, I mean, I did not write names here because in the classical case where everything is smooth, including the reduced space, I think this goes back to Stashev and uh, lots of, uh, I mean, I think also um, Kostand, Sternberg. I mean, there are many mathematicians who proved this. In the singular case, it was proved by Bodeman, Habeck, and myself. Um, and this is this uh, kind of long theorem that essentially it says that this BRST complex um, is quasi isomorphic to the Chevalier Island complex on. Uh, the constraint or on the zero level set. And therefore, and that's the most important thing is the, the, the equation on the bottom, the smooth functions on M mod mod G correspond um, to the zero homology of G with values in the C infinity of M zero, yeah? And even the Poisson bracket can be um, obtained homologically in this uh, sense via this uh, deformation retract. So, there is a lot of homological language and jargon in there. Um, and uh, I would like to refer to the paper, um, which just uh, was accepted with, with Schmidt and, and Rudolf, which was accepted in communications and math physics. So I write down here only the result. But anyway, so the important thing is that this classical BRST complex encodes the Poisson structure and the observable algebra on the um, reduce phase space. Okay, and now the um, really, I think, uh, surprising result is that if you have a Miltonian system, which fulfills both the generating and the acyclicity condition, then the reduce phase space possesses a deformation quantization, even though it might possess singularities. And how you do this is this classical BRT complex here possesses also deformation quantization. So that is a bit, writing this down is a bit uh, a pain, <laughs> uh, very long equality. So I thought that I don't write that down, but I just mention it because I think it's the, the red line or the idea is, is better to understand uh, just by mentioning it verbally. So you can um, take this A dot and, and take formal power series in this, um, deform the D and um, the nice, you can all do this with quite some technical um, stuff and, and get a deformation quantization. Anyway, that was the result uh, from 2007, the year Mike and I came here. <laughs> and uh, now let me just in the last couple of minutes uh, uh, come to the lattice gauge model. So, and, and, and there Oliver maybe, um, I'd be interested to hear your opinion or, um, and so on. So it's in principle, you, you look at an arbitrary Lie group. I mean, usually it's compact. So in, in our case, later on, it will be SU2. And you look at the cotangent bundle of some arbitrary power. And that's, that is obviously a symplectic manifold. The group G acts by conjugate action. So, and it turns out that uh, this map I wrote down here, J, T, star gn going to g star um, with this canonical pairing is a moment map and then you get a g hamiltonian system to my understanding this also has a nice um, hamiltonian i mean hamiltonian in the sense of energy function uh, could it be a coco suskind uh, hamiltonian as far as i understand um, so this seems to have some quite some interesting physical relevance. 
And um, now one can obviously form in the sense I defined before, the Marston Weinstein quotient, the reduced phase space. This in channel is highly singular, yeah? And okay, so the idea actually, or the question, Gerd Rudolf and Matthias Schmidt, who have been working with these lattice gauge models for decades, ask me is, can one apply our method of deformation quantization of Marston Weinstein reductions to this particular lattice gauge model? And obviously, if you go back here to this result here, what do you have to do? You have to just check that the generating and the acyclicity condition are fulfilled, and then you apply that result from 2007. Yeah. So the hard part was actually to show that for T star GN, this, uh, these two conditions are fulfilled. And actually, it is fulfilled. We, we could prove that that holds true. And um, giving then in the end uh, to a verification of uh, that such lattice gauge models have a deformation quantization. And that's maybe the, the main result I would like to present here, even though it looks very technical. So you start, I mean, we have done it for other Lie groups too, but um, for the, it's the nicest for G is SU2. So you start with uh, SU2 as your compact Lie group. It's simple, uh, um, similar simple Lie group. And you look at T star GN, omega J, exactly in the sense defined before. And what you do is you look at the Vidosov star product on this cotangent bundle. The cotangent bundle is smooth. You can use Vidosov. And then you can quantize the BRST complex. So the classical BRST complex I wrote down, you can deform that as well. And then you can check, okay, does the homology of the BRST complex, is that a deformation quantization? And it's essentially it is. And this is what this theorem says that from this quantized BRT complex in degree zero, um, you get a deformation quantization of the reduced phase space out. Um, the formulas are written here with certain restriction and extension maps. These are, by time reasons, I did not explain them in detail. Yeah? Um, the idea essentially here is that you have a function on, on the constraint set. You want to, because it's singular, there's no canonical extension map, but there exists some, and then you restrict again. So the idea of this formula, how this F tilde uh, star tilde G is defined, this star product is you, you take an, a, a function, an observable on the, on the quotient space, on the reduced symplectic space. You lift it to the constraint set, you extend it, you take the star product um, in, in T star GN by Fedosov, um, and then you restrict it again, and that gives a star product. So the final procedure is actually not so difficult. The question is just uh, to prove that that really gives you a star product. And, and th there is quite some, a lot of subtleties from real algebraic geometry which are involved there. And I, I have to refer to the paper or at some other occasion, um, explain those a little bit. Um, but it's a quite an interesting mix of differential geometry, um, Poisson geometry, real algebraic geometry and homological algebra to arrive at that result. Anyway, so it, um, let me just give the references of, of, I mean, I should give lots of references, but I, I just, I'm in particular via Flato and so on and, and all these uh, the, the follow up. But I just give the main uh, two papers on which our results were based. So the first one was by Bordeman, Habig and Flaum and the um, a homologic approach to singular reduction and deformation quantization. And then the most recent one, deformation quantization and homologic reduction of a lattice gauge model, which uh, I don't know whether it will appear this year or next year, but it's accepted. Anyway, I think uh, that's a good point to stop. And uh, if there are further questions. Great. Well, let's all uh, thank Marcus. Um,
and maybe there are some questions. I, I'll start with a question actually. So in the last stuff that you were talking about, this lattice gauge model, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I certainly didn't follow the details, but my rough, my rough understanding is that, uh, you know, this, the physical system that you're talking about would be, you know, it would be like a SU2 lattice gauge theory. Yeah. And I guess, uh, so, so what you're talking about is like how, so, I mean, I know quantum Hamiltonian descriptions of a lattice SU2 gauge theory, which I think you mentioned like a Kogut Susskind yeah. Hamiltonian, <laughs> but uh, I guess the question is, well, I, one question you could ask is what, uh, you know, what's a classical system that you can start with to quantize to get that quantum Hamiltonian? Um, I mean, that, which I guess is something I never actually thought about. Because usually when I've worked with that theories like that, I just write down the quantum Hamiltonian and just start from yeah. there. But, um, but I mean, that that's what this pertains to though, right? Uh, yeah. So it's I mean, sort of, you know, Right, trying to start with a classical version of that theory and then and then quantize it uh, yes. in some way. Yes, that that uh, that's exactly the idea. Um, as far as I understand, Gerd Rudolf and and uh, Matthias Schmidt have been trying for many years to first use geometric quantization and then, uh, but there were some obstacles and now they ask whether a deformation quantization approach worked and it works at least in principle. Now the next question would be to represent those on Hilbert spaces and construct appropriate Hilbert spaces and then see how those quantized uh, Hamiltonians look like in this Hilbert space representation. Because deformation quantizations are formal, you, you have to make them not formal again. Um, that's another tricky thing, but well, we'll see how, how that works. In the smooth case, uh, Fedosa has done a lot of work on that, yeah. Um, but there's still a lot to connect our approach to what physicists have been doing for many years, yeah. Um, I mean, the point is, the problem is just that, that here you get very quickly in, in really subtle technicalities, yeah. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I would be very much interested to see the connection. Yeah. I mean, is, I guess just following up on that, is. Can can I think of this as as an as an attempt to see from this point of view SU two lattice gauge theory? Yes, um, that that's that's it's just just pure SU two lattice gauge theory. That is the, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, to 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 have exactly the the mathematical uh, subtleties and uh, explained and and studied and understood in a rigorous way. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's the goal. Yeah. Hey, Marcus. Yeah. Uh, if I could comment on the Grunwald Van Hove problem, yeah, uh, maybe shed a little bit of light. Yeah. So, shall I go back? Oh yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so, uh, hi Andrea, it's nice to hear from you. <laughs> hey Oliver. Um, so Dirac was when he was trying to think about how quantum mechanics might be related to classical mechanics. Yeah. He came up with this idea to have this Lie algebra homomorphism, which basically uh -huh. just means that if you take two functions classically on phase space mm -hmm. and quantize them, then the commutator of their, uh, of those quantum operators should be the quantization of the Poisson bracket yep. of those two classical functions. Um, because in particular, it's satisfied by like your Qs and Ps, the positions and momenta. Um, so, so yeah, the, the problem, the Grunwald Van Hove theorem just proves that that map, a map that satisfies that property for all functions um, doesn't exist. Yeah. When you demand that the position and momentum operators are the canonical ones that we're all used to in physics um, and other assumptions like linearity of the quantization map and um, that constant functions map to the identity times a constant. Um, so, so for example, like the classical observable Q squared P squared, um, the way you can look at this theorem for that operator is that uh, there's multiple Poisson bracket expressions for Q squared P squared. Mm -hmm. And that multiplicity there leads to a non um, 
uniqueness of the quantized operator q mm -hmm. squared of q squared p squared and so that's why they say it's impossible um mm -hmm. because there's there's no unique map here for those operators and, and just to be sure when you talk about this non-uniqueness i can just think of that as operator ordering right p not, and q. not quite so not quite. so if you start with the two classical expressions for um so the two different Poisson bracket expressions for Q squared P squared equals like Poisson bracket of smaller functions with fewer factors of Q and P. You can get multiple expressions, uh, Poisson bracket expressions. And when you quantize those two, like those different operators, you get operators that even when written in the same ordering are different. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly an ordering problem. It's kind of related, but it's not exactly an ordering problem. Mm -hmm. um, like it, in the case of Q squared P squared, the two operators you get differ only in a constant term that's like H bar squared times some fraction um, mm -hmm. when you write them both in the same ordering prescription. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah. I think. Uh, I have, I have a maybe follow-up question. So usually when we think about ordering, we think that ordering, different types of ordering are different by factors which are which have age bar and some power in front. Mm -hmm. And so in the classical yeah. limit, that different simply disappears. So it's yes. kind of hard to see in what sense, um, in what sense, I mean, definitely there is, um, maybe this map from classical to quantum physics cannot be going both ways, right? In the sense, the two different quantum expression can correspond to the same classical expression. Yeah. But I mean, as long as one is happy with this, you think that there is a map. In a certain sense, if I understand it correctly, the um, the point is that let me just go back here to uh, now to deformation quantization. So you always have a, a classic limit. Just let lambda or h bar go to zero, but you could have various quantization maps. Um, where the, which are different, but their classic limit are, is the same. Yeah, and that is that has to do with ordering. So, for example, what you can do um, this weil moyal product here. Uh, let me just come back here. It's not the only way to quantize R to n. So you can actually shift around a little bit. You can in this exponential function you can have some correction terms which amount essentially to a different ordering. Yeah. And uh, I think in Fedosov's work, this has been nicely written down. Um, and, and people have, there are lots of papers out how to get the various orderings. And uh, one way is also that that was part of my PhD thesis actually where I try to represent um, observables and cotangent bundles by pseudo differential operators. And there you can have various ways of ordering, the Weil ordering, standard, anti-standard, then there's the big ordering and so on. And you can write that down really explicitly um, and, and have formulas, they are very technical, but they all lead to equivalent star products. Yeah, so they have the same line, the same equivalence class, um, but they have nice property. Wild quantization has the nice property that a self-adjoint classical observable goes to in a self-adjoint quantum observable, yeah, which standard ordering does not have. And, and so in this solution to the quantization problem, so notice that it, it no longer, Dirac's condition no longer holds in this solution. No, uh, and the, if, if you take, uh, yes. So, I mean, so mm -hmm. right, so in a sense that demanding that property of the quantization map was not totally correct. There's only a leading order uh, yes. yeah. ma mapping that, yeah. mm -hmm. that was successful. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's exactly the, yeah. And, and so just to kind of a, a different angle for this is that, so you can also, if you go back to Dirac's idea, if you relax mm -hmm. the demand that the quantum operators of uh, say position and momentum are the usual ones, mm -hmm. if you relax that demand, then you can find a map that satisfies Dirac's condition. Yeah. Um, and that scenario is called a pre-quantization because it's not exactly the correct quantization. 
Yeah. And and you mentioned that this is sort of where geometric quantization takes off. Mm -hmm. So geometric quantization has the feature that it represents directly on Hilbert spaces. And you have first the spree quantization, which is highly reducible. And then uh, you, you mod out stuff. And, uh, but then you lose, I think it depends a bit on, on what you do exactly then, but you mostly use, uh, uh, um, lose um, some um, observables to be quantized anyway. Okay, thanks, Andrea, for, for helping us with this. Um, I was wondering, since we're a little over, is there any other questions that we want to throw out? Any postdocs or other students or anyone who wants to ask something of Marcus? I have one question. Yes, uh, James, go ahead. Okay, so you've talked about like, these different, different methods of quantization. Are they guaranteed to give the same result every single time? Or can you have more than one type of quantization or even within one class, like let's say one deformation quantization, two quantizations? Um, um, I, so I, I did not quite understand. So, so you're asking uh, um, about different quantization classes. I mean, they, um, they, exist not, they exist more deformation quantizations and the one can classify them. Um, but what, I think you had a question about the various uh, uh, classes. Uh, yeah, I was talking about, for example, the geometric quantization or the formation quantization. Oh. Would they give the same result or? No, no. I mean, actually, the, the, they, they do not give the same result. I mean, there is, is some work by uh, Good, Ronsley, and others where they constructed deformation quantizations out of, um, out of geometric quantizations, yeah? And uh, the, one can describe the characteristic class of that, but it's a it's a bit a tricky thing. Yeah, it's in principle these are two different approaches, and it's hard to to get the relation between them. But there is some literature, and that goes back to and also Schlichenmeier did some work in this. Yeah. Okay, and then just a follow up. I think this is the last one. Uh, is it possible to have more than two, in some sense, in equivalent deformation quantizations? What would that mean? For the quantum mechanics of the system you're studying? Um, the point is, it does not show up that often because let's see, harmonic oscillator, R2n, and so on. The homology is trivial. So there it doesn't show up. Everything is essentially in the same equivalence class. It shows up only if, if the underlying M is not, does not have trivial homology. And uh, I can't answer, I actually, I think some stuff where Aaron of Bohm effects and so on are studied, that can be interpreted somehow in, in, um, with um, the language of a different um, equivalence classes of, of, uh, of deformation quantizations. So that there is some relation in that, but it does not show up when the underlying phase space is topologically trivial. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can, can I ask, um, sorry, uh, so with this, um, he's sing at, at the end, you're talking about these singular phase spaces and then yeah. quantizing them by modding out by some group action or something. Um, do you, do you always get a C star algebra? Of those no, like, no, the, the, these are not, you, they, they are star algebras, but they are not C star algebras. So they are not actually even normable. You need to represent those on some Hilbert space, and you have to. That's that's actually, I think, Fedosov was the first who defined asymptotic Hilbert space representations, and then certain Bohr quantization conditions come in. But that's a whole additional area um, which is highly interesting. But it's there one still can do a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we've, uh, it, it's good that there were a lot of questions. I think we've uh, gone a uh, little bit over our time now. So we should probably thank Marcus again. Thank you. So thanks, Marcus. And then uh, let's conclude. So Victor, you can probably go ahead and stop the recording now. Okay. <laughs>